Hello and a warm welcome to this episode of Into the Light Web podcast with me, your hostess, Joanna Hunter. And today we have got another beautiful client story. We are sharing an epic journey with my client, Jane. Jane, welcome to the show and come and introduce yourself and tell people what it is that you do in the world. Hi, thank you. Yes, I'm Jane, Jane Duncan Rogers of janeduncanrogers.com. I came into Joanna's world um, maybe a couple of years ago now and having met you through Denise Duffield Thomas's website and her group and I paid attention to, to the comments that you made and I liked them so I already knew that I liked you when I heard about the million dollar experiment and um, so then I signed up for that now that was the first time round, and I didn't and I was about six months late after you had first started it and at that okay. time it was a closed group so I started off all gung ho and I thought, oh, this is great, fantastic. I read the book, I thought it was wonderful. And and then of course, after I don't know how many weeks, I just didn't do it anymore. <laughs> but I I didn't beat myself up for that. You know, I was doing it and I hadn't um I didn't have uh the the, the, the company that I needed because I hadn't got to know people to start with right at the beginning. Um what when I first came into your world, though, because I'm now in several different programs with you, mm -hmm. um, I was running a company called Before I Go Solutions, which was mm -hmm. uh, a training company to train people to help other people make end of life plans. Now, this is a really unusual subject, and it came about as a result of my husband dying a few years ago. And before I actually joined your, uh, I think it was Divine Planning Abundant Profits group. Mm -hmm. the business academy i had had an inkling that this it might be time for me to not do this business anymore but this was a bit of a shock to me because i thought it was my um lifelong business sort of thing and it mm -hmm. felt really important i really cared about it but being in the all the different types of things that you were doing made me realize that actually this inkling that I had noticed was something that I needed to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And so it's only just recently that I have let go of that business into somebody else's hands. And I'm now working as a spiritual business coach and author, um, focusing on rich thinking. Brilliant. Brilliant. So it's been quite a journey. So from the Million Dollar Experiment, tell us a little bit about your experience within the Million Dollar Experiment, because although we didn't finish it, but that doesn't matter because that's not really, it sounds weird to say, well, that's not the point. You know, the point is to start thinking differently. The point is to start planting seeds that grow into different things. So when you made that transition from, you know, you obviously read the book, was there any big takeaways that you had from that book or anything that you were like, wow, okay, this is shifting my mindset financially? Yeah, the biggest takeaway, I think, was the plan itself, because it was simple. And that's one of the things that you say often, it's it can be simple, and it needs to be simple. And that um, things that feel to be complex actually usually have a simple answer, if you're willing to yeah. notice it. And uh, I thought the plan itself, it just made sense. Whether I chose to follow it or not, that's another matter. The plan itself made sense. But, you know, that book, it's full of, full of golden nuggets. It really is. So I'm probably reading it now for the third time. And each time, I know everybody says this, each time you get something different. But the fact is, how many people actually do go back and read something twice or three times or listen to something four or yeah. five times, whatever? But you 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 come to it as a different person because the first time around you learned something and that's affected you. And then so the second time around, you're listening with or reading with that different persona of who you are. And so yeah. by the time I had done these things, I was like ready to, I think I signed up for your uh, money love class. It was a one-off class. Right, I couldn't okay. remember it because <laughs> we were going on holiday that day and I had made sure that I got everything with me so that I could do that class while I was um, on holiday. And the very first thing that happened was that somebody on in the airport rang me 
I would never normally accept a call like that in the airport, but I recognized the name. It was somebody who had expressed interest in the training. I took the call and she basically said, yes, she wanted to join on the phone. And then the payment came through that week. And in fact, that week that we were away, there were three sales made, which was about six or seven thousand pounds at the time. And it was like, oh, my goodness, I really can do what it says in the million dollar experiment. And also in all your other things, which is you can it can be easy to welcome in money. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Amazing. I love that. I love that. So when you got into divine planning abundant profits and you started in there, um, we were in this very different business, which was a business that was super dear to your heart because it it was um I definitely feel like it was part of your soul mission, you know, that that you had to birth that business, right? Like that was such a big thing. You had been through a big event with the loss of your husband and then no life plan and then realizing, oh my God, every single day, hundreds of people go through this Mm -hmm. and there's no life plan. So I feel like that was such a poignant thing. But as that inkling was scratching away at you, I know um, our earlier conversations about your business. Um, I know we left you a little bit shaken and stirred. Uh, because yes. <laughs> I could see that it was more than an inkling. I could see that it was you had outgrown that business. Tell us a little bit about that, because obviously trying to deliver news like that, it's never easy. Um, and it, it's not not everyone's ready to hear it right as well um so let us know where you're at with um what happened as that kind of unfolded yeah well it 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 unfolded over time I, I took the thing that happened was that I had an image of a ball and chain around my ankles now I knew that wasn't right I knew I felt like the business was taking me over as opposed to me running the business now yes. There were all sorts of structural reasons for that, where it could have been improved. But essentially, something in me, and actually you said it, like I had outgrown it. Now, I at that time, I hadn't recognized that I had outgrown it. Mm. I just knew that I wasn't as happy as I had been. I just knew that every day I wasn't having a joyous feeling of coming to my desk. It just wasn't there anymore. And But the thought of having to... um, not do it and not know what else I was going to do was quite alarming because I'd started it because I had after my husband died I wrote a book a memoir gifted by grief which explained all about this what I had gone through and all the amazing spiritual insights I'd had and yet people had responded to the chapter about the questions that I'd asked Philip before he died, which were really practical ones, like what um, type of coffin do you want and how do you want your body dress and your passwords, you know, really practical things. And that's how Before I Go Solutions got started. So I really cared about it. But I also now had this image that didn't feel right at all. And um, But I have always usually been pretty honest with myself, even if I'm a bit behind sometimes Mm -hmm. (laughs) with catching up with everything. And so you you affirmed, really, I think, um, what I knew was already going on. And when I remember one of the classes with you, I wrote in my journal, I've gone off death, which felt like a really sacrilegious thing to say, given the given the company I was running, you know. But the truth was, I just didn't have the passion to talk about it in the same way as I had been. And I trained lots of other people to do that. And um Anyway, long story short, I realized that actually for my own sanity, I needed to pay attention to this. And I uh, told the board, our board of directors that I was going to going to stop. And I didn't know I wanted to get somebody else in to take over the managing director role. But if that didn't happen, then I would be willing to close the company down, which was the absolutely last thing that I wanted to do Mm -hmm. because it's still doing great work. And there's loads of potential and opportunities still for it. It's just that I wasn't the right person anymore. I love that. I love that you recognized all of those things because anybody who's listening to this, like 
let me tell you, I know Jane's journey intimately because I same thing happened to me when I was running my shops and I got to a place where I had the passion for them wasn't there to the same capacity that it had been when I first started. And I had outgrown that energy and it was very easy to spot the same energy in, in Jane mm -hmm. as she was outgrowing it. But it's a incredibly difficult and emotional journey to kind of work through because it isn't a case of because there there's all these emotions that come up like guilt feeling bad that that you're now no longer so into it um and there's a lot of self gaslighting that goes on in that process um I remember calling myself in that process Princess Joanna Princess Joanna no longer wants to do her business you know in, in my shops that I'd had and and that was me 100% gaslighting myself um you know and, and diminishing my own feelings and invalidating my own feelings as I was going through that process but it is a necessary process to keep growing and keep evolving into this kind of next phase so you started Divine Planning Abundant Profits with one business and we did make some really magical changes to your business at that time as well because yeah. we helped you a lot and um, made you realize where perhaps there was power and energy and money leaking in your business as well. So we, yeah. we got that to a place where we got it on track to get you to a place where someone else could actually take over and transition yeah and now you are in this glorious new phase of really reinventing yourself and a new business for you as well which is amazing and tell us a little bit about that because that feels so magical how that all came about especially about the rich thinking mm -hmm. um stuff that was like that was so cool I loved hearing that <laughs> Well, here's the thing, because it was tied up with Before I Go Solutions still, because um, this was the beginning part of this year. So spring sort of time, early spring. And I was clearing out the bookshelves at home of all the Before I Go Solutions stuff that needed to go to the new person. So I was going through everything and I came across this manual that I had printed out uh, called How to Be a Rich Thinker. And I remembered that way back, this would be, would have been two thousand and eight to 2011 or so I was running my coaching business as rich thinkers that was the name of it and I had written this and at the time it was I I hadn't published it as a book or anything I pu clearly published it as a a ring binder thing for me to look at and put in my uh, bookshelf but I'd just forgotten I can't believe that I can say that now but I'd forgotten that I'd done I've done the same thing with a million dollar I began writing that book yeah. and then kind of it was there in the back of my mind, but it wasn't something that was like in, in my consciousness daily. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, I sat down one evening to read it. And as I read through it, I thought, oh, my God, this is really good. I'm going to have to get that out there. <laughs> so that was a few weeks ago now. And I real I knew somehow I love writing. Right. That's my favorite thing. Um, well, at the moment it is. Who knows what might happen in the future? But anyway, so the idea of putting this out again, it needed some updating because I was talking about tapes, you know, audio tapes, which was, you know, not very relevant these days. <laughs> but um, so, yes, it needs to be updated. Anyway, the the that is how the idea of me actually focusing on writing books for uh, spiritual business women, probably, but business owners, it could be men as well, but usually it, it tends to be women in my world, um, about how their thinking affects their business and how it affects it negatively and how it affects it positively. And the wonderful thing about all this is that it really ties up with my origins because way back in 1990, I trained personally with Louise Hay mm -hmm. and I was the first woman to bring her work to the UK and Europe. And I did that for about 10 years in the 90s. And I loved it. Um, and um, my life took different directions, so I didn't carry on with that. But I feel like I'm coming back full circle in a way to the thing that really lit me up right from the start. And 
I think also that's one of the reasons that I was attracted to you, Joanna, because you have the same blend of practicality and spirituality that Louise Hay had. And I really respond to that. I like it, you know, because we are, we may be spiritual beings, but we are clothed in a human body. So we do have our foot in both camps and we do have we've to got, look- We've got to have that boots on the ground. We have got to have our boots on the ground. I fully, I mean, that is such a beautiful compliment because Louise Hay um, is literally one of the reasons why I'm still here. She, um, her work was instrumental in keeping me on this planet because I was, um, you know, I, as you know, I had chronic illness and, and which I don't have anymore, which is amazing. And it was her work. She, it was that one sentence that she said, if they tell you that it's incurable, know that it's incurable from within. Wow. Wow. And, you know, knew, know that it's curable from within. So if they tell you that it's incurable, and that's what I've been told, I've been told by doctors, I must accept my diagnosis. I must accept that this is the way life is. And I couldn't accept it because I thought, well, if life wasn't like that before, but life is like that now, and I haven't had like some, you know, horrific car accident or something like that, that really, you know, could, you know, create physiological changes. I'm still this same woman I just couldn't accept that my body couldn't heal from whatever I had and um and everywhere I went everyone was like no no just accept and then it was Louise Hay that said you know what when they tell you it's incurable know that you can cure it from within and that's when I began to really look within myself and obviously I'm still here today to tell the tale which is amazing yeah, she's she has given a great gift to the world and continues to do so. There's no doubt about it. 100%. 100%. That is what I call in my world a legacy of light. When your light endures beyond your mortal years here, which is a big thing that we encourage people in Divine Planning Abundant Profits to create a legacy of light. And you've already created a legacy of light with your Before I Go Solutions. And now someone else is got the torch of that light and now you're about to really step in and create a new legacy of light with all the new things that you're doing yeah and and actually that's an interesting thing to think about because I when I when I did join the million dollar experiment this time around which has been very different um because of course I'm fully participating in it and learning a lot I realized that how first of all I took the pressure off having to having to (laughs) you can hear my mind already (laughs) having a little go but Mm -hmm. having to make a million in a year right I thought it doesn't matter if it's in a year or not I learned from you already that you know what matters is not giving up and carrying on it doesn't matter about the time so then I thought well if I'm writing books they could still be making money after I'm dead so it's like it goes on forever (laughs) yes really open things up to the possibility of yes why not I can affect millions of people I can have millions of pounds or investments or whatever it is and I can do good with them because a million having you know people think about a millionaire or a million pounds or a million dollars or whatever it is and they think that's the thing that will do the trick but you know it's who the person is that gets that money and what they do with it that makes it good or makes it bad so I just feel excited about all this. I'm excited about that too. I think this is one of the biggest issues that I find with spiritual people. And you've been around a lot of spiritual people for a long time. Yeah. There's absolute aversion and rejection of money. It literally makes my little heart sink to my boots. Let's talk a little bit about that because I feel like that could be really juicy. Yeah. But um, Tell us your experience of hearing, you know, there, there's these people that I find like spiritual people that are just so rejecting of money. It's, it's, it's evil. It's bad. It's this. And for me, I just see money as a tool. It's like, it's like calling your garden spade bad because you can bury a body with it, but you can also dig a garden and create a vegetable garden that feeds your family. You know, it's, it's the hands that are using these tools that are really the good or the bad thing. But I think a lot of people, you know, they they do love to blame money for a lot of things. Yeah, they do. And 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 I used to be one of those people. And so my journey with money, and which is why I ended up 
talk, uh, creating a business that I call Rich Thinkers was um, has been very up and down indeed. I've had none at all and been in incredible debt and had a lot and lost it all and had to deal with this, this outer um, world uh, evidence, if you like, of mm -hmm. money, not money in itself, not caring what, what happens to me, you know, and, and also um, realizing that a lot of this was, from my point of view, was down to actually how willing was I to, to receive money. So I've clearly been willing to receive money in the past because at some at, there's a whole story about this, but at some point we had um, quite a lot of money, several hundred thousand pounds in the bank, actually in the bank. I mean, that's unusual. It didn't stay in the bank for very long because obviously it was getting invested, but mm -hmm. um, we actually, and, and we put it into a new business it, uh, in Ireland. This is me and my uh, first husband, Philip. Um, and, and we lost it all in the credit crunch and ended up owing at least that amount of money. I think it was about 350,000 pounds to the bank which was terrifying we didn't have anything at this point no assets nothing um and it got resolved in a miraculous way and how I and of course I want to say something about that miracles miracles by definition I think are things that the mind cannot think of so if we think we know what's going to happen mm. limiting the ways or the the way that life can give us and we're limiting the amount that we are able to receive because by definition a miracle is something that you won't have been able to think of you look back and you can see that it's outside your perception I of this problem or the situation I find often a miracle is living outside of the perception of what you're available for at that time and even though you're available for the miracle because otherwise the miracle couldn't come but you're you're not perceiving that that's how it could come exactly exactly and so for me for the last I would say a couple of years at least I've been very consciously working on a willingness to receive good mm -hmm. and being challenged by that because it looks mad on the surface that I mean, because on the surface, it's like everybody wants more good stuff in their lives, good stuff, good experiences, good feelings, whatever, apparently. But when I dug a bit deeper, I could see that there was all sorts of little ways in which I was not actually that willing to receive. So and that, this brings it back to the million dollar experiment again, because one of the first lessons, I think, was about deservability. And mm. I'm still working on that one because in my mind, I'm like, deservability what does that actually mean again <laughs> and, and having to explore for myself what uh, to unpack it all and to understand that actually how good can I stand it you know there's mm -hmm. a lot of good out there an amazing amount of abundance and it's all actually within me as well if I'm willing yeah. to open to receive that how good can you stand it and I think this is one of the things like when I see spiritual people and they're rejecting money and they say, oh, money means nothing to me and, and things like that. I think it's very privileged, first of all, to be able to say those words. Yeah. Um, but I think if we take the word money and we swap it for survival, mm -hmm. we start to see a lot of spiritual people that sound like they have a death wish. You know, survival means nothing to me. Yeah. Because in the West world, money is essential for survival. It's keeping that roof over your head. It's keeping food in your belly. It's, you know, even if you grow your own, you're still going to need the supplies, like the raw materials to, you know, which again, last time I looked, they cost money. Yeah. And so this open rejection of, of money, um, especially in spiritual circles, I have mulled this around many, many times. And one of the things I think that it's come up for me is that it's a trust issue. It's a lack of trust. I trust that I am a good person, but I perceive money as this bad thing. So therefore I reject it because I do not trust that this thing that I perceive as a bad thing will not corrupt me. Yeah. But I find that money is much like source. It's an amplifier of energy. 
-hmm. And so if you are a good person, you can be like a bigger good person with money. And if you are not a good person, well, guess what? You can be a bigger a-hole with money, <laughs> you know? Um, but it, at the end of the day, I don't think the money really changes anything other than it just amplifies the energy that was already there and so the reason why a lot of spiritual people struggle with it is a lack of self-trust they don't trust that they could be this force for good with this resource called money what do you think on that what's your thoughts on that no i i completely agree with you and i i um i don't think i had thought about it in the words that you use as as you've just so coherently explains but when you did when I first heard you talking about that I was like oh my god this it was quite humbling actually to mm. recognize that actually was this a was my inability to receive money cleanly and beautifully and respectfully to money um was that actually a reflection of how much I didn't trust myself and the mm. truth of it was there were elements that was true where it, there was parts in my life where that was true and it was showing up in feeling not hugely guilty but mildly guilty about what I do have already and mm. feeling like I wanted to share it with people but the the wanting to share was not coming from a healthy place it was coming from a place of feeling like I shouldn't have it somehow, you know, it's not fair, all that mm. kind of stuff, all the stuff that had been around for ages and had been, I'd been addressing it, but you know, it's like the layers of the onion skin. It go, it's, there's always a bit more to have. We look at if you want to until yeah. it's not there anymore until it really isn't an issue. Mm -hmm. but I do think this thing about treating money, you know, people often talk about treating money as if it were a friend and it's to, 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 to uh, push it away and to dismiss it and to say, I'm I'm not interested in money. That's not my motivation. That's like, um, that's being a bit rude. You know, it's not being a good friend. No. Um, it's not my main motivation either. My main motivation in life is to make a big impact in the world and to affect people and have them be happier and healthier and live their life to the full in abundance. And as you said, we... Having some money to do that really helps. Makes really the job helps. way easier. Makes the job way easier because it's just a resource, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, it's just a resource at the end of the day. Tell us, you have been in, so you have been in my Divine Planning Abundant Profits program, my million dollar program, which are quite practical programs on the aspect of kind of money and also as well, uh, divine planning is all about building your business, but you're also in some of my programs that are not so um, practical. They are um, they are more on the spiritual aspect, on the energy aspect of things. So tell us a little bit of experience or of what your experience have been of those programs as well. Well, um, mainly I think the I've been in your Be Your Own Rescue um, program, which I love that title because, I, again, I was being challenged by it. You know, can, can do I really? Do I really want somebody else to rescue me? Well, actually, yes. When I looked at it, the truth was there. <laughs> I did. And usually for me, in most of my life, it's taken the form of a man with a lot of money. Even when I was 16, I can remember I had a dream of having my own business. At that time, it was going to be um, a riding holiday establishment and it would be uh, the money would have come from my rich husband who worked in the city and was never around. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> but anyway, I hadn't realized this, you know, that this had been a thing going on. Um, and was still... I remember having a conversation with my um, my cousin uh, many, many years ago. We must have been about 10 or 11, and we were planning on marrying rich. This was something, and I think this is something that's so deeply conditioned in so many women. I know. You know that that was your pathway or access to money. And again, it's just that looking for rescue, right? Somebody else to do it rather than you being the one to lead yourself. Yeah. And we look to this outside source, whether it's a rich husband or whether it's winning the lottery or whether it's something that is outside of us. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And actually, I can remember my having a conversation with my grandmother when I was early 20s or something. And she basically said, you don't really need to get a job because your husband will look after you. 
And I said to her, I'm not going to get married. <laughs> but actually, anyway, that's another story. But, you know, that's a generational thing. Yeah. That was different. It was like it was different then. Anyway, uh, to come back to Be Your Own Rescue. Yes. Well, I kind of I did know and have taught and have been in other programs where people say it's all in the energy first. You have to get the energy right. So one of the wonderful things about joining some of your programs is that you can go and repeat them again. And I think this is the third time that I had done Be Your Own Rescue just recently. And of course, here I am coming at it again in a very different way and realizing that now I'm willing to actually do <laughs> what you and other people have said, which is don't take action. I mean, I've said it myself. Stop. Be still listen and only then act it's been one of my mantras but I haven't always uh put it into practice Let, let's put it that way I'm much more willing to do that now much more willing to just pause and take some time and calm down on the outside the personality reconnect with the place of peace is what I call it inside from where different actions come or the same actions come, but with a different energy. And then and it makes it so much more beautiful to actually do the doing then. So I really feel like yeah. that is something that I've learned and continue to learn, which isn't new, you know, but putting it into practice is different, makes it different. Yeah, finding that practical application of that, because there's many things that I've heard and then sometimes they just don't land and you you intellectually think you know them but then when it isn't until they are what I call an embodied energy yeah um and that's I mean you touched on something there that this is your third time doing be your own rescue and I think that's one of the things um I think the fact that you can repeat these programs because I go through them every time I teach them I go through them myself and so I think the fact that you can go through them again and again um helps with the embodiment of the energy of the transmission of light that we're giving within these programs and the teachings of Skylar. Tell us a little bit about your experiences with the teachings of Skylar, because obviously you have several of the teachings now. Um, what has been some of your kind of biggest Skylar takeaways? Um, well, I think there, there's probably lots of things that I could say about specifics, but the thing that is coming to mind right now is it has given me the confidence to listen to my own inner guidance, my own version of Skylar, if you like, which I have never talked about before and have not been out there about it at all, but have um, listened to and written down for my own life over many years, actually, but I just never called it what I ne never called it channeling I was fit up was a bit embarrassed about it you know I never called it anything I just thought people would think that I was bonkers it's taking me all these years to understand that yes I'm a bit world. Bonkers. I am a bit different from everybody else and that's okay <laughs> <laughs> so from my point of view that the 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 beautiful relationship that you have with Skylar and the wisdom that comes through and the the way that is embodied sometimes in in very cheeky words and uh, uh, and quite a lot of humor is like, oh, so you mean this really is OK? And I can listen to this aspect of that comes through me and I can pay attention to that. And and it's OK. It's like somehow. They and you obviously have given me permission to be more of who I am in this world in whatever way that shows up and that's I mean that's priceless beautiful thank you I love that I think that's I mean that's a big thing Skylar always talks about our life purpose being a bit of a cosmic joke because I don't know like you if you have maybe sought your life purpose and looked everywhere high and low under boxes under up on shelves for that fabled life purpose um, and Skylar teaches that our life purpose is actually a bit of a giant cosmic joke because 
everybody has the same life purpose. And when I first heard that wisdom, I was like, no way, you know, no way. I like to fight Skylar a lot. So I'm like, no way, there's no way everyone on the whole planet, 8 billion of us have all got the same life purpose. And Skylar says, well, well, you do. Your life purpose is just simply to be you. Because the way source appears in you, it does not appear in any other being in that way. Mm. And that was so eye-opening for mm. me. And a giant permission slip to be myself. Yeah. A giant. Per and that meant having to take ownership of the weirdness that I channel a collective consciousness. That I hear voices in my head and know I do not need to be fitted for the straight jacket. And, you know, and and all of that stuff, I had to take like responsibility for all the quirks, all the things and integrate them into myself instead of openly being rejecting of them and, and editing them out. I think a lot of people edit their own personalities yeah. um, and they, they pretend that that isn't really what's going on for them when it is absolutely what's going on for them. And I think, you know, it's such a beautiful compliment to hear that being in my world and hearing the wisdom of Skylar has given you that unconscious connection and um, permission, which is your own permission at the end of the day, because yeah. no one can really give you the permission. But knowing that that has led you to being able to give your own permission to being yourself fully, which is beautiful. I mean, that is that is magic and also as well that is when we become our most magnetic selves as well that ability to really fully unapologetically be ourselves and I love the way that Skylar always teaches it Skylar always teaches that as if you imagine that you're sort of laying horizontal and your body lays keeps laying down but your soul sits up inside your body so your soul is sitting up and you're still laying horizontal. But that's kind of what happens when the soul sees through your human eye someone else that is so gloriously embodied in who they are. Mm -hmm. And the soul recognizes it instantly. So it's like it sits up and takes pays attention. It's like, I'm watching this one. I'm looking at this one because they're doing something that I kind of desire to be. I desire to be myself. And that's all we, as human beings, we desire to be ourselves. Yeah. And yet we have another desire, which is to belong. Yeah. yeah. And so the ultimate is to belong while being ourselves, you know? Um, and I think sometimes those two don't live together. Yeah, no, that's Belonging cool. and being ourselves. Sometimes what we have to understand is that we have to belong to ourselves first and foremost, and then we will belong anywhere. Yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it because it's so easily done to be looking out there for where I belong. I can remember when I first moved up here to Scotland, um, which was 17 or 18 years ago now, and I felt like I belonged for the first time in, in an area that felt like mine. Um, but... That, and, and that was lovely. I must say it was lovely because I had never felt like that before. But I um, but the belonging to myself, that's another an inner journey. And it I belong to myself. Myself belongs to me more than ever before. And it's really very nice. Yeah, very nice. There's an I've just thought, though, of another thing that I really liked um, from Skylar. Well, and that's from you, obviously, then, is um, the simplicity of just two things, the source and the void. Mm. Oh, my God. That was, I mean, I knew this, right? But I hadn't known it in, the, in the, those uh, such simple terms. Because it's really easy then to tell what's going on. <laughs> you know, if it feels good, yeah, it's from source. If it doesn't feel good, then it's not. So something needs to be attended to. But but then that brings in the whole thing again of how good can I stand it? So I can say right now, OK, most of the time in my life, maybe 75, 80 percent of the time I'm feeling good, which is great because it wasn't always like this. But then there's another 20 percent. Hang on a minute. That's too much. You know, so I have to expand my willingness to feel good again and to challenge that and to receive. And it all sort of uh, goes round and round and round together. 
each all feeding in together. But when you simplify it into void or source energy, it's very simple. Very simple. It gets very simple. I think that for me was um, when Skylar really, really began speaking through me was when I was going through my recovery of my multiple organ failure. So that's when I really began to go inward. And I had a lot of complex problems. I had multiple chronic illnesses layered on top of each other. I was in debt up to my eyeballs at the time. Uh, there were so many, like what felt like very, very complex problems. And there was something so soothing in hearing Skylar's words saying the solutions are simple mm -hmm. because I don't think I had the capacity for complex at that time. Yeah. You know, I'm simple. I could do complex. I could not because I already had so much stuff that was complex and the plate was already full. And this idea that my solutions could be simple. And I remember really the first time of the source and void lessons landing for me and realizing that there when Skylar really taught, taught me there's only these two emotional states mm -hmm. there is love there is fear that is it and anything else everything that you think is negative is actually fear and everything that you experience is positive whatever you call it it doesn't matter what you call it it is love yeah. And that, therefore it's source and therefore it's the void and it's this source and void and this is it. And I just remember it was like I was seeing the world for the very first time and, and seeing through a completely new lens and realizing my chronic illness, void energy. What yeah. can I do to flip the switch? And, and just the simplicity of that. Yeah. And realizing, and then realizing, I think the next part of that is realizing that both source and void have natures. Yeah. Um, and that's been huge as well. Realizing that, that, you know, the nature of a dog is to be a dog. Even if you can train your dog to meow, it doesn't turn magically into a cat. It will follow the nature of a dog and that's it. And when I realized that void energy it wasn't evil it wasn't bad it wasn't there to wreck my day it was just its nature its nature was that it takes away from you it diminishes life yeah that is its nature that's it and it isn't doing that like to you it's mm. doing that for you that yeah. was another big mindset shift and then the source realizing that source is nature is to give and so the more that you align to source the more you receive because the more source gives yeah and it was just like oh my god I felt like I'd been given the secret of the universe yeah absolutely and and uh, I can remember thinking that about void energy and realizing that the more I pushed it away the more it was going to be there you know like and, and then I remember, OK, so they say what you resist persists, you know, but that's one of those things that just trips off your tongue and then you don't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Actually, if I stopped attaching, let's say, quotes, badness to void, to the void energy or to fear or any or, or anything that belongs within that category, then I could actually enter into that place in a slightly different way so that I'm. I can see it simply for what it is, which is showing me that I'm just a bit off track. That's all, you know? Yeah. It's like, God, it becomes magic then. And then mm -hmm. everything that is not um, of love or that feels good becomes a gift. Then it becomes a gift. Yes. So then I was able to see, look back. I, I called my memoir of my husband's death gifted by grief because I did feel gifted by his death. You know, not initially to start with. It was awful, of course, because I had to go through the grief and everything. But but the whole process of that allowed me to see, oh, this is a gift. And it's exactly the same with all the other things that happen out of void or fear or whatever. They can become yeah. gifts as well if we want them to be. There's absolute gifts in the void. I mean, when I look at some of the the kind of horrible experiences that I've had and things that did not feel good at all, they they've served me in one of two ways. Um, the first way is they've moved me out 
of that situation because they were so deeply uncomfortable I was like bugger this I'm getting out of here yeah right? which means that I and if I moved somewhere good if I moved my energy somewhere that felt amazing I can't be grateful for the place that I moved to that's amazing and then being upset that the void was the thing that got me there right like I have to then also I have to give the gratitude in equal measure I have to give the gratitude to the void and then I have to give the gratitude to the the being in the good place where I have now shifted myself to so that was one of the first things or the situation was so crappy that when I did move myself to somewhere good, I would provide this deep, deep contrast that would make and elevate the moment that was good mm-hmm. into the stratosphere. It would elevate it so highly because I knew the opposite end of the spectrum and I knew how terrible it could feel. And actually now I'm not experiencing that. So I am more grateful yeah. than I would have been if I just had had it good all the way through. And so there is so many gifts, I think, to receive from the void, but they need a level of consciousness before we can appreciate them. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And that, and, and that, you know, I can see that that's played out in my whole life um, and will probably continue playing out like that. Um, and at the moment, I'm working with this idea of, well, how good can I stand it? You know, how willing am I to receive good things? How willing am I to receive full stop, which could be things that I label not so good because they've got a gift, as we've said, you know, so. They have, absolutely, absolutely. I often find that the things that are not good in your life are your growth edge. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So Skylar has another lesson that's really, um, really fits with this conversation. And it's, um, it's a lesson on real estate. Mm -hmm. so the source is real estate and void is real estate and if you want to have more source energy in your life because you're already at capacity you have to reclaim the real estate from somewhere Mm -hmm. so since we want more source we can't go to source to reclaim the real estate because we've already planted our little source flags there on that piece of energy So what we have to do is we have to go to the void and we have to look to the void and say, I need that real estate for source. I need that real estate. I need shadow islands. I need to, I need to, I need the shadow islands and I need to plant my source flags and turn them into the light islands. Mm. Or I need, I need that country over there. I need that real estate. I need those pieces of real estate from there. So mm-hmm. it's the reclaiming of real estate. And that's been such a, a, a massive lesson for me because what that means is in order to reclaim the real estate, I've had to face the fear that the real the, the current owner of that real estate is the void. So mm-hmm. I've had to face the void within me in order to be able to reclaim the real estate. And how do you do that? Well, you take the light of source and you shine it yeah. on that real estate. And that is deeply uncomfortable because what you have to do when you're doing that as an internal thing is you have to see your own shadow energy. Yeah. And you have to see your own stuff and your own judgments and your own places where you shot yourself in the foot, like all of those. And then that takes tremendous courage to face that with courage and reclaim that real estate. But because once, but it's so worth it because once you reclaim that real estate and you reclaim it in the name of the light, you bring it over to source. And because source's nature is to always give, the situation will always give more. Mm. And that's where our more money is. That's where our expansion is. That's where the extras that the more that you were maybe looking for in life that is where it's living right now right now source is always giving you are always receiving you are always at maximum capacity okay you want but you still as a human being want more well you better go and have a look at that void real estate and see if you can't reclaim it you know because what the void is is the pieces and the parts of us that we have rejected to some extent yeah 
yeah exactly you know um and it is and it is that pieces and the parts of us that we have rejected and there's such it's it's such uncomfortable work to look at you know but it's so worth it and the the clue is in the discomfort that you feel at looking at it because that means you're already outside your comfort zone yeah I think a lot of people think uh, coming out of their comfort zone is getting up on a stage and speaking in front of lots of people because that's so uncomfortable you know no that's that's just one way that we can get out of the comfort zone getting out of the comfort zone we can do it from the comfort of our sofa with a journal and being willing to look at how good can I stand it yeah exactly exactly and you know to some degree and maybe often actually that kind of inner work that nobody else can see is yeah. more important because then it infuses everything else that you do do out there in the world that that um that other people can see anyway you're not doing it for other people you're doing it for yourself for your own sanity I would say you're doing it for your own sanity yeah. well I am anyway <laughs> me too me too but I think this is another concept of Skylar's which is really beautiful to get selfish work yeah. And the unity work, you know, of really getting selfish and unifying with yourself first and foremost. And, you know, at first, when I first was really bringing forward the, the get selfish work to heal myself, it was terrifying work for me because I had been so deeply conditioned to overgive and to um, you know, I've been so deeply conditioned in that states of energy of overgiving, people pleasing, all of those things, which I know you recognize intimately as well. Yeah. You know, these were okay. all states of energy that that you were engaging in as well. Yeah. And it is terrifying to start pulling back yeah. and saying, okay, I need to give to myself first. It's yeah. very out of the comfort zone. It was very out of my comfort zone at one point in time. And now it's literally just embodied in how I roll. But, you know, one of the biggest, and I don't know if this is something that you agree with, but one of the biggest epiphanies I had in that body of work that I call Get Selfish in Unity was, um, of course, I had no business helping others when I wasn't really willing to help myself. And it was like that big epiphany, like how could I teach others about love if I didn't love myself first, how could I teach others about stuff if I didn't value myself first to do that thing, you know? And yeah. I, I realized how many places I'd been asking and praying to the universe for an energy that I had point blank refused to give myself. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sobering when you realize that, because I, I also recognize that. And one of the ways that I've reframed it for myself is instead of thinking I'm being selfish I'm actually demonstrating self-care so that then then if you're willing to do that or if when, I, when I'm willing to demonstrate self-care then I can be genuinely caring towards other people and show that side of myself or uh, set things up so that other people are going to benefit from a genuine place and um and also I've also I've always been somebody who's willing to um be vulnerable and tell people I'm not perfect <laughs> well actually who's the person who thinks I'm perfect only me you know it's like nobody else probably thinks that but um so but this thing about selfish it's um and I really like the title of your book that gets get selfish the way is through because yes it is you have to go into the idea of being selfish which you know I can remember a time it was quite a long time ago now, but I can remember a time when somebody called me selfish and I was I was just so offended, you know, but over time I began to see why they had done that. And so then it began, then it became a gift because I was willing to look at it and to um, go deeper into what was happening in me that would allow that to show up on the outside as people labeling me as selfish in a way that I found that was self-critical, that was critical at the time. I don't I haven't had that for years now, but uh, I still get challenged. But isn't it funny, though, that sometimes people come along and they really project their, their want and their desire? Because yes. I remember 
you know, maybe silently judging people many, many years ago in my own head and thinking, God, they're so selfish. But secretly, I wanted to be the one that put myself first. Yeah, me too. You me know, too. It was a, a, but I did, I hadn't given myself the permission for that. Yeah. So then I had this energy, it was like a ball of energy inside of me that had nowhere to go. So the only place I could place it was in a judgment and yeah. be like, well, that person's so selfish, because that was to say that was like a self soothing action. Yeah, it's okay that you're not giving yourself the permission to do that. And it really was nothing about the other person. It yeah. was just my perception. Absolutely. And, and my own self, in my own judgment, which ultimately, you know, that's one of Skylar's lessons there is, are you judging it into your life? Are you judging it out of your life? And I mean, that's another really beautiful lesson. Yeah, like, no, no. Is it, it coming in or going out, you know? I can remember doing that. This is years ago now before I met you. But to put it in that language, I was judging out um, uh, uh, somebody I knew somebody who lived in a very big house a really lovely one here in this in the town that I'm in and every time I went past the house I'd be criticizing it I'd be criticizing her and I, I this went on for quite a long time before I realized what I was doing and when I realized though oh my goodness was that an opportunity to really look at how I was limiting I was judging it out of my life in that language you know yeah absolutely. I realized that it was like but hang on a minute I secretly want what she's got so why don't we just admit that and do the things that I need to do and be the person I need to be in order to be able to welcome that in and of course now I live in a most fantastic house that I'm just thrilled by so yeah yeah it's amazing isn't it and it is like it is one of these things and you realize like when you when you start to go through this and you move into to use your words rich thinking but you become a rich thinker mm -hmm. and you start to think in a more abundant way in a more source aligned way and you yeah. begin to think like that you start to realize how many places in the past you shot yourself in the foot and you start to realize holy moly like I was literally my own worst enemy you I know, know like I was daily rejecting wealth and then wondering why wealth was not showing up for me that was I think one of my big things I was like what? I yeah. was really really rejecting wealth and it was like how st stupid in a way you know <laughs> because the the one thing I wanted the thing I felt was going to fix my problems and stuff like that. I was through my own judgments, through my own ways of being, through my own behaviors, was literally on a daily basis rejecting that. Um, yeah. And it is, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. you know, I can laugh at that now. And uh, even at the time, sometimes when I discover something <laughs> where I'm limiting myself, I can laugh at it. But I wasn't always able to laugh at it. You know, I took it all a bit seriously. Um, as if I was a bad person for being like this, but it's not helpful to to uh, to delineate things into good or bad. I think not really. No. Much much more kind and loving to just accept them the way they are and see what the lessons are, both whether you think it's good or or bad. Yeah, yeah. it's a trans. I think first of all, we need to understand the source and the void, the good and the bad. Yeah. But then we only need to understand that in order so that we have the capability of transcending it. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. I definitely, you know, agree. but if we don't have the awareness of the source and the void or the good and the bad, then we it's very difficult to transcend an energy we have no awareness of. Yeah, which all points back to doing that inner work, you know, and, and that being the way Absolutely. that you live your, your life. And, and that comes first. The energetics yeah. comes first. I was having Reiki this morning and I was speaking to my my lovely Reiki lady who's also a client of mine and um it was really funny because I said I, I was talking to her about some things that I'm moving through at the moment and I said it's that split spiritual personality like my humans like oh, are you kidding me uh, and like super reactive you know but spiritual joanna is like this is great like this is the growth edge this um discomfort that i'm feeling is awesome you know this is such an opportunity and 
and all of that. And I always call it like this. I, I like to laugh at myself because I just call it, you know, it's the split spiritual personality because you, you're you so acutely aware of your human absolutely freaking out and having a, a little ball to ourselves. Yeah. And then you've got that spiritual side that understands the assignment. Yeah. And is like, OK, this is the opportunity. Like, how are we going to work the energy? How are we going to work this situation? Um, you know, and how are we going to look for the places where we can yield and surrender yeah. so that we enter the flow and things? But it's so funny um, mm. in the fact that we can observe all of that yeah. behavior in, 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 you know, in the duality of that behavior as well. The, the understanding and the wisdom that comes from our spiritual selves and then the the human um, which I you know I've, I've come to really love and accept my human so I think it's hilarious that she's having this like freak out and she's just like oh my god yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's right that's exactly right oh <laughs> makes me feel um uh warm and loving towards my human you know and and that's great you know, we can do with a bit more warmth and lovingness in our lives, can't we? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. If somebody is listening to this and they're maybe sat on the fence about jumping into from million dollar into like the, the deeper programs and things or uh, they're new into my world, what would your kind of advice be to them? Uh, well, one is listen to your heart, not your head. But two is, you know, be kind to yourself, take a, a baby step, just do what I did, which is I bought one of the, sh the smaller priced masterclasses. And uh, but I, and I knew very quickly after that point that this was right for me. You know, it was like it so much resonated. And so then it becomes easier and easier to to take uh, something that is maybe more commitment, both time and financial and uh, and and eventually for me it was right right to go into divine planning abundant profits and um even though at the time i had a business which i had taken care of quite a lot of things that you were teaching in there but uh, there was a whole lot that i hadn't paid attention to mostly about the energetics but anyway i i did use it for that and here i am now with a new business and i'm looking at it again through different eyes so yeah it, it is that thing of what you talk about in terms of increments you take one step at a time and if the first step yeah. is uh taking a making a small commitment fantastic do it amazing thank you jane tell people where they can find you on the internet so where can they find you uh, right now, the best place to go is my website, janeduncanrogers.com, where you can contact me direct. I'm on Facebook as well as Jane Duncan Rogers and um, LinkedIn, um, also Jane Duncan Rogers. In fact, I don't think there's anybody else called Jane Duncan Rogers in the whole world. <laughs> so <laughs> if you type that in, you'll probably find me, um, although you might find me associated with Before I Go Solutions. But there's also a way to get hold of me through that website. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much. And we'll make sure we'll pop some links in with these show notes. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode, Jane. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you.